and world. This is Bishop Clark, and thank you for joining us tonight. Another edition of 15 Minutes in the Word. Why? Because 15 minutes is enough time to change your life. I'm coming to you today from the People's Palace, where Word Assembly meets, where our business is ran, grab and go, uh, where this past Resurrection Sunday, we celebrated the life of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, and we gathered in person after a year and a few weeks due to the pandemic. Now, of course, our services uh, won't uh, start back consistently. We'll let you know uh, when we're going to do that. But I was so excited to see so many of you all, your faces, and able to just wave at you. And a few of us snuck some hugs in, and we had taken our shots. Praise God for that. But it was so good to see your word and know that I love you so much, and I felt the love from you as well. Sunday, I shared with you a message entitled, The Ministry of the Mask. As you know, that during the pandemic, many of us uh, have been, be many of us have become uh, mask carriers. In fact, about it, uh, I shared Sunday that what I have to do is I've got to leave a few in the uh, car so I won't forget them. And I can't tell you how many times I've gotten out of the car uh, <laughs> to go into the store realized I forgot the mask and had to go back and get it. And as I thought about this issue of the mask and the importance that it has during this pandemic, when I started thinking about the purpose of the mask, my mind and my heart, the Lord led to the gospel of Jesus Christ. Now the mask, you know, is designed to protect you from people and people from you as it relates to the virus. We're told that if you wear the mask, you not only stop the spread, if perhaps you are asymptomatic, but also you protect yourself from those who may have the virus. Well, when I think about that, I think about the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news, that when you and I have the gospel, we not only protect ourselves, but we also, in our sharing the gospel, protect others. Protect from what? Protect, obviously, the greatest thing is that it protects us from hell damnation. It protects us because the gospel allows us to have our hearts and our minds guarded in safety and security, knowing that our heavenly father, because of the gospel, are in relation. We're in relationship with him, rather. And that relationship is safe and secure. And so we started talking about that Sunday. And I wanted to over the next three nights, go in just a little more detail because we were limited on our time together Sunday. And I want to share with you again those three things in a uh, more sufficient, I would like to say, uh, way than I did on Sunday because I just kind of uh, skimped over the surface uh, Sunday, gave you the word, but I wanted to go in more detail because I think the importance of of this issue of the ministry of the mask is essential if we're going to be the church. The scripture we use a Sunday as we went over the first letter of mask, uh, M-A-S-K, M meaning mindful of the message, that if you and I are going to involve ourselves in the ministry of the mask, and again, remember now, the mask is designed to protect you as well as others. And the gospel of Jesus Christ is our protection from anything that the enemy will bring our way. And it's our protection from an eternal separation from the Father. When you have the gospel, you have a relationship with God through our faith in Jesus Christ. With that being said, I wanna go back to that passage we dealt with uh, on Sunday. It's in Acts chapter 20, verse 20 and 21. Listen to what he says. Paul is writing, as Luke records his words, uh, he's gathered all of the leaders of the church at Ephesus together, and he's giving uh, what he uh, seems to in his conversation to be the last time he will meet with them as he continues his journey uh, that we know will end in debt. He will be uh, crucified, or rather he will be beheaded by Nero, as a result of his stands and his strength and his commitment to the gospel 
of Jesus Christ. Listen to what he says. Luke records his words at that meeting. He says in Acts chapter 20, verse 20, you know that I have not hesitated to preach anything that would be helpful to you, but I've taught you publicly and from house to house. Verse 21, Paul says, I have declared to both Jews and Greeks that they must turn to God in repentance and have faith in our Lord Jesus Christ. You see that in verse 21, when he says, I've taught you both, verse 20, I've taught you both publicly and from house to house. And he begins to share what he taught. He says, I taught both to the Jews and the Greeks that they needed to repent toward God. Repentance toward God is simply changing your mind toward God. That word repentance means a change of mind that results in a change of action. So when it comes down to us repenting uh, towards God, it's us changing our minds about God. And then Paul talks about who he's speaking to. He says, I, I said this message both to the Jews and the Greeks. The Jews were those who were religious. The Jews were those who were law keeping, uh, those who were committed to the Torah. And as a result of their commitment to the Torah, they had a distorted view of God. In Romans chapter 10, if you read that, Paul goes a little deeper in their distortion of God. He says, I bear them record that they have a zeal of God. Watch this. But it's not according to knowledge. Romans chapter 10, verse one and two. And so here he says, I taught the gospel. I taught the gospel. And what does the gospel entail? It entails us having a different mindset toward God. He says, and then when you change your mind toward God, it causes you then to put your trust in the Lord Jesus Christ. He said, I taught that to the Jews, but I also taught that to the Greeks. You've got the Jews who were religious and committed to their tradition, who was committed to the Torah, the law. But then you have the Greeks who were some educated, uh, some were well-trained in culture. So they weren't religious. We would consider them to be worldly. And Paul says, I, I, I shared with them the same thing that I shared with the Jews about changing their hearts and minds toward God and placing their faith in the Lord Jesus Christ. While the Jews, you guys, were religious, you had the Greeks, watch this, who were worldly. So you had one group thinking that uh, they were all right with God because they were keeping the law. And then you had another group who figured that they could never be saved. They would never have a relationship with God because of their lack of religious rituals. Doesn't that sound familiar today? Doesn't that sound like the, the place in which we live? Doesn't that sound like Oakland? Doesn't that sound like New Orleans? Doesn't that sound like New York or anywhere else you want to go in this country and the world? That there are those who believe they are right with God because of the things they do. And then there are those who believe they can never be right with God because of the things they do. And Paul comes along and says, listen, I want you to know that if you can turn your heart toward God, if, if you can really come to understand that God's not mad at you, that you are not God's project, that you're his passion, that he's not out to get you. He's out to love you. And as a result of you changing your mind toward him and understanding how he feels about you, you're then opening yourself up to receive the message of Jesus Christ. And that is the gospel, the good news that Jesus died for all of your sins, that he was buried. And on the third day, he rose again. I went on to share with you Sunday and I want to spend some time the next three nights dealing with those three things in detail. And that is that once you receive Jesus Christ, once you uh, put your trust in him as savior, you acknowledge and accept him as Lord. And, and that happens as a result of you understanding that God's not out to get you, but God's out to love you. Once that takes place, you understand that this gospel, this message that we have to keep our minds on, 
in this ministry of the mass. Am mindful of the message. What happens is you start understanding three things, and I want to go into detail with them over the next three nights. The first thing you start understanding, and that is that God, or rather you are right with God by what the Bible declares as being justified. If you've got your Bibles, go with me to Romans chapter 5. Romans chapter 5. And in the book of Romans, Paul, again, uh, who Luke is recording his words in the book of Acts. But here in Romans chapter 5, Paul is writing this letter to the believers at Rome. And listen to what he says. He says in verse 1, Therefore, after having discussed that we are not saved by our works, but we're saved by faith. And he uses in the minds of those uh, hearers, or in, he uses to those who are reading this, he brings them to Abraham. Now, you've got to understand, Abraham, uh, for those who he's writing to, was understood to be the father of the faith. You, no, nobody's greater than Abraham. You got Abraham, then you got Moses. Them two fellas there, and then you get David. You, you're talking about a, 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 the big three. Abraham, Moses, and David. And those were always the go-to for those uh, uh, Jews who uh, were always trying to make it in on their behavior and not on the fact that Christ had come and did what Christ uh, had done. And so Paul is arguing that and he deals uh, extensively with that in Romans um, chapter 4. He gets to chapter 5 and listen to what he says. He says, therefore... Since having been justified through faith, that word justified means to be made righteous is an accounting term. And it's a term that deems one has been credited something. And Paul says that we have been credited righteousness. Righteousness has been given to us because of our faith in Jesus Christ. He goes on to say, because of that, we have peace with God. Now, I want to stop right there. Because I think that is, uh, if I could use this term, I think that's a selling point that oftentimes is ignored. And as a result of it being ignored, it hinders us from wearing the mask, if I could say that. The ministry of the mask, again, is what we're talking about. And again, that mask, so we're clear, is given so that we can protect ourselves as well as others and the gospel is what protects us from anything that would seek to destroy us. Listen, he says we have peace with God. That word peace there uh, is, is the idea that there is no enmity. There is no problem. There is no trouble. There's no differences. There are no odds between us and God because of the gospel or our faith in the gospel of Jesus Christ, the good news. Now, the reason why I want to stress that, because I believe there are too many people who are living with an understanding that God is some God, is some being rather, who is keeping score and based upon your score, he's going to allow you to either get in or he's going to allow you to go to hell. In actuality, the truth of the matter is the only thing that will get you in, the only thing that makes you right with God is faith in Jesus Christ. The only thing that makes you right with God, it's not your behavior. It's not your church attendance. It's not the amount of money you give. It's not your attempts to love everybody. What makes you right with God is is your faith in Jesus Christ. And when that happens, you and God are at peace. I want to encourage you tonight that this ministry of the mask, M, being mindful of the message, means we have to communicate to people with conviction and persuasion. Those of us who are undertaking this responsibility of being ministering of the mask, we have to communicate to people the message that Jesus Christ came so that we could have peace with God.
I felt like I just couldn't take life anymore My problems had me bound Depression weighed me down He kept me close So I wouldn't let go I'm